Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, for coming. My name is Keith Tebow. I'm the Director of Television Services here at Bristol Community College and also the Director of FRC Media, which is the City of Fall River's public communications outlet. This is uh, the third, which <coughs> we hope will be a continuing series of communication symposium speakers where we invite those in the industry to talk to you, to share their knowledge about what they do day to day. Our first uh, three now uh, seminars were actually focusing on the news industry, but we also hope to expand to other fields within the uh, field of communications. So those of you who will be back in the fall and next spring, uh, we welcome you to come back at these events in the future. Um, as always, we will be welcoming questions for our speaker, but because this is on video, please wait until I come to you with this microphone because we want to make sure that all the questions are recorded on the video today. So please keep that in mind and uh, I'll do my best to get up to you wherever, you wherever you are. Dan Kennedy is Interim Director at the School of Journalism at Northeastern University. He's also a nationally known media commentator who writes for the Neiman Journalism Lab, WGBHnews.org, the Huffington Post, among other publications. He's also a regular panelist on Beat the Press, a weekly media roundtable that's seen on WGBH TV Channel 2. He teaches news reporting, media law, and other journalism courses with an emphasis on blogging, multimedia, and social networks. A former media columnist for The Guardian and The Boston Phoenix, Dan is a 2001 recipient of the National Press Club's Arthur Rouse Award for Press Criticism. He's also the author of Little People, Learning to See the World Through My Daughter's Eyes, a memoir about raising a daughter with dwarfism. Dan's blog, Media Nation, tracks issues related to journalism, politics, and culture. Dan has received his bachelor's degree in journalism from Northeastern University, back at his alma mater, and his master's degree in American history from Boston University. From 1979 to 1988, he was a reporter and editor for the Daily Times Chronicle in Woolburn, Massachusetts. His talk today will be focused on his latest book, which is entitled The Wired City, Reimagining Journalism and Civic Life in the Post-Newspaper Age, where he explores the world of online and regional journalism with focusing on the New Haven Independent in Connecticut, which is a nonprofit news organization founded 10 years ago now in 2005. Please join me in welcoming Dan Kennedy. Thank you. Well, thank you for that nice reception, and, and thank you for coming to, uh, to uh, attend this today. Um, what I'm always interested in when I do these things is to see what's on your mind. So I figured I'd probably talk for about a half an hour, and then we can open it up to see what you're interested in. Uh, maybe uh, we can talk a little bit about what's going on in the news today. There's quite a bit going on today. Uh, we might also talk about some things that have happened in the news business more recently than what I wrote about in The Wired City. Um, in any event, what I wanted to begin with was by talking a little bit about how I came to think about doing this particular, um, this particular book. Um, and it really began with a very influential blog post written in 2009 by Clay Shirky, who uh, is a very influential thinker in kind of the media and technology space. He wrote a book a number of years ago called Here Comes Everybody. And the idea is that today everybody participates uh, in the media because technology has provided the tools for them to do this. By the way, I should mention that the executive editor of the Washington Post, Marty Barron, uh, gave a very important speech last week about the future of journalism. And he actually referenced this 2009 blog post by Clay Shirky, Shirky quite extensively. So you can see that uh, it continues to resonate um, six years after Shirky wrote it. And what Shirky wrote was called Newspapers and Thinking the Unthinkable. And the idea was this. Um, there were several important ideas in there, but the one that I took away from it was this. Um, 
He said, we're living in the first years after the Gutenberg press was invented, essentially. He said, in the 1400s, Gutenberg developed his press, first press, and we read about that. And then it seems like we fast forward 200 years and there's pamphlets and books and the beginnings of newspapers. And, uh, and we say, gosh, all that sprang from the head of uh, Johannes Gutenberg. Uh, and he said, well, in fact, what would it have been like in the immediate years and decades after the invention of the Gutenberg press? Um, he said, it took a long time for people to figure out what to do with it and how to use it most effectively. And he noted that it took a very long time to develop the book stemming from the Gutenberg press. And he said, that's exactly the situation in which we find ourselves with the internet and newspapers. Uh, we know that print is passing from the scene. We know that everything is moving into the digital space, but we're still in the very early years and we still have no idea what that's going to look like. It's much easier right now to think about what we're losing and what we're losing is traditional newspapers, although I would argue we're not losing them as quickly as Clay Shirky thought we were going to lose them six years ago. Um, we know what we're gaining. We're gaining a whole new digital world, but we're in this very in-between stage, and we don't really quite know how that's going to shake out. Now, because we're losing newspapers more rapidly than we are figuring out what the digital future is going to be, uh, there's quite a loss in terms of the public interest journalism that we need, uh, frankly, to govern ourselves in a democratic society. Um, and this is especially true at the local level. Nationally, the New York Times is in pretty good shape. The Washington Post is growing. NPR is doing well. There are a number of national outlets that are continuing to perform that public service role of engaging in accountability journalism. Locally, it's more difficult. Locally, it's more difficult. And what Shirky said was that many things, no one thing will replace newspapers, but many things may come along to replace part of what newspapers used to do. Um, and he pointed toward three areas that we should be looking at uh, for new forms of digital journalism. The, and, and the reason I'm pointing back to Clay Shirky is that the Wired City really takes a, a look at all three of the different models that he talked about. He talked about the nonprofit model which is what I wrote mostly about, uh, new forms of for-profit, and finally, voluntary efforts, which are problematic, but nevertheless, there is some importance to trying to see what volunteers can bring to the table. Now, before I decided to focus on the future of local journalism. I looked at some other projects, some of which panned out, some of which didn't. One of the projects I looked at closely that didn't really pan out, but nevertheless represents a very interesting idea, um, was a project called News Trust, which was a nonprofit social network built around the news. Um, what people would do is they would join the community and they would submit news stories, mostly articles, but some video journalism, uh, some audio journalism. And the person submitting these would rate these stories. It was subjective, but there were guidelines that you were supposed to follow. You would rate them in terms of thoroughness, accuracy, um, fairness, which is a word I like much better than objectivity, fairness, um, 
and, and whether overall it was a good piece of journalism that contributed to our understanding of the issue. And then, of course, other members of the community were asked to uh, offer their ratings and comments as well. And um, it, w it went great guns for a few years, nonprofit founded, uh, funded by foundation grants, but it eventually fizzled out. Uh, today, it's slightly alive. It came under the wing of the Pointer Institute for Media Studies, but they don't really seem to quite know what to do with it. And the hopes that this would be a major contributor to the conversation uh, really didn't pan out. So what went wrong with News Trust? Well, Rory O'Connor, who was the first editor of News Trust, later left and did a study as to what he thinks went wrong. Well, first of all, there were some very simple things that were wrong. It was kind of cumbersome. It didn't really attract enough people to have the critical mass you need to do something like this. But there were some structural problems involved as well. One of them was that for some reason, as much as the organizers of this wanted to attract people from diverse backgrounds, the overwhelming majority of News Trust members, uh, members were liberal. And they never really got conservatives or moderates. It was all told from a liberal point of view. And as a result, it, that diminished its value because we weren't really seeing the broad range of thinking that, that people wanted to see with News Trust. The other reason, which I thought was absolutely fascinating, is, is somewhat related to this. R Rory found that Facebook is actually better for this than News Trust was. And he said, with News Trust, the stakes were too high. You would come into News Trust, join the community, and you'd say, by God, I want to submit some stories and, and offer some ratings and make some comments. And you were kind of making a statement about who you were and what your beliefs were. Whereas Facebook is a very different environment. It's, you know, we went to New Hampshire this weekend, great new restaurant. Here's a picture of my cat. And by the way, um, here's a story that I saw that I think you might be interested in. And he said that liberals and conservatives actually come together more effectively on Facebook than they did on News Trust. Now, I make my living, in addition to being a journalism professor, I make my living as an opinion journalist. So I don't mind telling you that I skew liberal. But I know a lot. I have a lot of conservative friends. And they'll show me stuff on Facebook that I'll read because, well, it's from them. I want to see what they have to say. And, and so in a weird kind of way, I think News Trust was trying too hard. And Facebook has been actually more effective. Now, another project that's worked better and is still around and still thriving, although it never became as well known as the people behind it might have wanted, is something called Global Voices Online. Have any of you ever heard of or visited Global Voices Online? It's not that well known, but among a certain group of people, uh, it's a very useful tool. Started at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society, which is based at Harvard Law School, and I think that it is about 10 years old now. Uh, Global Voices Online tracks citizen media around the world. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, let's say next week, I don't want to wish an earthquake on Vietnam, but let's say next week there's an earthquake in Vietnam. And you want to know what people on the ground might be saying about that. Ordinary citizens. And I think that we all have a sense that there are people who would be doing just that. But how do you find them? How do you know if it's reliable? How do you know that it isn't some imposter who never left his mother's basement in Brooklyn. Um, Global Voices has editors, paid editors around the world who track citizen media in their area, their part of the world. 
We've had students at Northeastern who've gone on to uh, track media in their home areas. We had uh, one woman was doing it for Puerto Rico, where she's from. Another from Paraguay, uh, a very undercovered region. Um, and it's, it's, it's of great value. It's mainly of value to journalists um, who have to come up to speed on something very quickly. And they'll go to Global Voices, and there's a reliable editor who has take a note of what ordinary people are posting to Instagram and Twitter and blogging about and posting to Facebook in that area. Now, I actually went to a conference in Kazakhstan in 2009 and had a chance to interview the Central Asia editor of Global Voices, but ultimately I decided not to include it in my book. Um, so this kind of brings me to what I did write about. Um, have any of you heard of the book Bowling Alone? It's a famous book uh, by a Harvard sociologist named Robert Putnam. Um, and, of course, these women are not bowling alone, but I love the picture, so I had to use it. Um, but his book makes the argument that we are far less engaged in civic life than previous generations were. And the idea of the title Bowling Alone is that at one time people bowled in leagues, a very civic group community type of activity. And today, I say today, the book's 15 years old, today we bowl alone. And the title itself was overly optimistic because what Putnam's findings really were was that people are not bowling either in leagues or alone. They're staying home and they're watching TV all the time. Um, and he said, this is bad for civic life. This is bad for the life of a community. Um, but conversely, he also found that people who were engaged in civic life in any way you can imagine, um, they coach a youth sports team, they attend religious services, they write a letter to the editor, um, they vote, uh, they belong to a social club in town. Those people were far more likely to be newspaper readers. Um, and this kind of leads to the insight that one of the reasons that local journalism has gotten into trouble is because fewer and fewer people are really interested in what local journalism covers. The city council, the school committee, what's going on in your neighborhood, development projects. If people are fundamentally not really interested in those types of things, then they're not going to pick up a newspaper or they're not going to look at a community news site or for that matter, uh, the group that is not interested in that is not going to be watching Fall River Community Television. Um, so how do we re-engage the community, get them interested in civic life, so that in turn they're interested in journalism? So there's both an altruistic and a financial incentive to rebuilding civic life in some way. We really need to rebuild community ties. These folks are rebuilding community ties by sitting down and talking with each other, which is better than sitting home and watching TV, or I suppose better than bowling alone. Now, from the beginning, I had wanted to include the New Haven Independent in my book, and it ended up dominating my book just because it hit so many of the points that I thought were important if we're going to rebuild local journalism in the digital age, in the post-newspaper age. This is Paul Bass. Uh, Paul Bass and I had similar career traje trajectories at one time, although we've gone in very different directions over the last 10 years. Um, 
Paul was a journalist at the New Haven Advocate, which was an alternative weekly newspaper, and I was a uh, columnist at the Boston Phoenix, another alternative weekly newspaper, more or less at the same time. Today, neither of those papers exist. In the early 2000s, Paul and I both left our papers to write books. Um, and uh, when I was done, I started charting a path toward moving into uh, teaching at Northeastern. And Paul decided he didn't want to go back to the New Haven Advocate, but instead he wanted to start his own news site, which he dubbed the New Haven Independent. Interestingly enough, he had done a print version of the New Haven Independent for three years back in the 1980s. But he thought, well, gee, with the digital tools that are available today, I can do it much more cheaply than I could then and maybe have more of a chance of success. So in 2005, he started The Independent. It is, it's at New, in I'm sorry, newhavenindependent.org, if you want to take a look at it at some point. Um, it is nonprofit. What do we mean by nonprofit? Um, what I mean is, he does sell a little bit of advertising, but it's organized in a way that most of his money comes from donations, from local foundations, from uh, what's referred to in the trade as high net worth individuals, um, some advertising from local institutions such as hospitals and colleges, um, and some reader donations but not a huge amount of reader donations because New Haven is a poor city. Um, it is, uh, very similar to the public radio model, but public radio stations tend to serve much larger areas and their listenership base tends to be rather affluent and well-educated. Uh, the New ha Haven Independence readership is strictly limited, well, it's the subject matter is strictly limited to the city of New Haven, which is uh, a largely African American and Latino community. Um, and they read The Independent pretty avidly. Now, um, this is the single most important piece of technology that the New Haven Independent uses. People tend to think, oh, everything is very you know, you have to master technology. Well, you know, what he has is there are four full-time journalists. They ride around the city on their bikes. Um, they cover stories everywhere across New Haven. They write stories, they take pictures, they shoot videos, and uh, all of it goes on to the news site. Um, there's a certain type of uh, news that they cover. Um, there is a daily newspaper in New Haven called the New Haven Register, which has definitely had its ups and downs. It's been through bankruptcy several times. I should say its parent company has been through bankruptcy several times. There were a couple of times when I was reporting the Wired City when it looked like the New Haven Register was on the verge of a great comeback. Uh, they had good people running the company. They were going to embrace digital journalism, and then you'd turn around and they'd gone bankrupt again. And right now, the entire chain is up for sale. So that never worked out. But the independent serves an important niche that the register really wasn't serving. What's the difference? The register um, was largely focused and is largely focused on the suburbs around New Haven more than it is on the city. Uh, that's where the readers are, that's where the money is, that's where the advertisers are. Um, the New Haven Independent does not cover anything outside the city. Uh, you could be standing on the border of New Haven and Hamden and looking at a fire taking place in Hamden, and unless there was some New Haven angle to it, they're not gonna cover it. So they said, nope, we're going to be hyper-local, focused on New Haven. There are plenty of great stories to tell here, and we're going to tell them. Uh, the New Haven Register has about 80 journalists. 
the New Haven Independent has four. Well, gee, how can you can compete? There's no way you can compete, right? It's, it's, it's actually an even match. It's an even match. You look at the register, they have staff photographers. The New Haven Independent takes photography very seriously, but their writers are also good photographers. Um, the New Haven Register has reporters in the suburbs, sports reporters, several layers of editors. Um, I don't mean to suggest that the New Haven Register is fat. It's actually a very lean operation, but it's a much more of a traditional newspaper operation that does many different things. Um, when you come right down to it, the Register has four reporters covering New Haven, just like the New Haven Independent. Um, the Register's interest in New Haven, and remember, they're reporting for a largely suburban readership. The two things that the New Haven Register seems to be interested in when it comes to New Haven is uh, Yale and crime. Uh, the New Haven Independent will cover crime if it's important enough, but they also cover city politics in great detail. Uh, they cover the public schools extensively. Uh, New Haven is the home of a very interesting um, school reform movement that actually represents a very rare collaboration between uh, the administration and the teachers union. Um, they cover anything in the neighborhoods. Um, they will do tough, hard-hitting journalism, but at the same time, they celebrate city life. In the summer, every week, they'll feature somebody who has a, a, a cool garden in their yard. Um, they do a lot of very tough, critical reporting on the police department. But at the same time, they have a feature called Cop of the Week, which highlights the good things that the New Haven Police Department is doing. That serves them in very good stead when they're doing the really tough stories on the New Haven Police Department. It's kind of... It's kind of uh, karmic money in the bank, you might say. So those are, those are really the two, dif the two differences. As I said, the independent works because of a hyperlocal focus on the city's neighborhoods and quality of life issues. The fundraising base is more like public radio than like a newspaper. Now, the, the independent kind of struggles year to year, but they generally have their funding lined up a year or two ahead. And given what's happened with traditional newspapers and the problems of selling advertising, I think that the uh, Independent is probably has as bright a future as the New Haven Register. Um, this fall, the Independent will celebrate its 10th anniversary. Uh, I was there for their fifth anniversary party. In fact, I, I write about it in the book. I hope to go to their 10th anniversary party. That will be a lot of fun. And then finally, and I know you may find this hard to believe, the comments are great. Um, I think we've all become accustomed to looking at comments on news sites and just you know, wanting to gouge our eyes out because they're just so horrendous. Well, the Independent takes comments seriously. Not a single comment goes up until one of the editors, one of the uh, journalists at the Independent has taken a look at it and said this meets our community standards. They do allow anonymity, but they don't allow you, to, but on the other hand, you do have to register with the site under your real name, which is something new they've done the last couple of years when things began to get a little out of, out of control. But you, you can comment anonymously. And um, the result is uh, actually a very constructive conversation about the news sometimes. I once, um, Paul once corrected me on something, and I thought he had a, a very interesting observation, and I came to realize that he was right. I wrote a blog post about the Independence Comments policy, and I said, Paul Bass is so devoted to encouraging a civil conversation in the comments that he would rather have fewer comments than have you know, racist, homophobic comments, which are unfortunately so 
typical of news site comments. And he contacted me and he said, well, gee, thanks, but he believed that he got more comments as a result of his policy. His belief was that there's a lot of people out there who will never post a comment because they're afraid of getting attacked by sociopaths in the, uh, in the comment section. And he said that by creating a civil space where vigorous debate can take place, but nevertheless it's a, it's a safe environment in terms of, of the real hate mongering that you see on some other sites, he believed he was getting more comments. And I think he was probably right. Now that's the nonprofit model. I told you that I got into um, the other two models that Clay Shirky talked about as well. Not as much in depth, but I nevertheless um, uh, uh, took a look. One of them is the Batavian, which is a small for-profit news site in Batavia, New York, way out in western New York. Uh, it's, it's a small city amid a huge agricultural area, uh, midway between Buffalo to the west, Rochester to the east and north. And uh, the Batavian was started in 2008 by Gatehouse. Um, Gatehouse, as some of you may know, uh, owns about a hundred newspapers in eastern Massachusetts, including the Fall River Herald News and the Providence Journal and the Brockton Enterprise and some of the other papers around here that, that maybe serve you, the Taunton Gazette. They, they, they own them all. Uh, Gatehouse is headquartered in Fair, Fairport, New York, which is just outside of Rochester. Howard Owens was the director of digital publishing for Gatehouse. He was one of the top executives in the company. And he brought to his, um, uh, to the people running Gatehouse an idea that said, what if we started an online only news site? What if we could say, we're not going to tie our news site to a print newspaper. We're going to do something that's its own thing and we won't be bogged down by the type of thinking that sometimes prevents us from being as innovative as we want to be because we have a print newspaper to worry about. Batavia was fairly close to Gatehouse headquarters. It was the sort of thing that they could keep an eye on. So they said, okay, let's try it in Batavia. So it launched in, thebatavian.com launched in 2008. And in early 2009, uh, Howard was called into somebody's office and told what many, many people who work for Gatehouse have been told over the years, and that is, you don't have a job anymore. We're eliminating your position. Um, Howard said, okay, can I take the Batavian with me? They said, go ahead, see what you can make of it. We're happy to let you have it. So starting in early 2009, the Batavian became kind of a throwback to the mom and pop weekly papers of several generations ago. Just Howard and his wife, the difference is that it's online only. And again, in the, in the shadow of daily newspaper competition, there's a, a small daily out there just called the Daily News of, of Batavia. Um, he's carved out a niche and um, made the Batavian a success. Now, how has he done that? That's, uh, that's Howard. Um, I show that to my students and I always tell them, uh, if I was a good photographer, I would have had the Windex taken out of the picture. Although I think I would have left the, the, the little, I think that's Elvis. I'd have left the little statue of Elvis, but the Windex would have gone. But I, I do what I can and that's what I ended up doing. Um, why does the Batavian work? Now, at this particular point in the evolution, the early post-Gutenberg years that Clay Shirky talked about, there's actually more money in nonprofit than there is in for-profit. 
For-profit is a really tough way to make a living with an online-only news site. So Howard does not have the kind of reporting resources that Paul Bass has available to him in New Haven. So what you see is Howard writes almost all the stories himself, and you see a lot of short hits on what's going on in Batavia and in the surrounding villages of Genesee County. And it kind of gives you a nice flavor of the details of life in, uh, in this rural area. Uh, and it's proved very popular with, um, with readers. Um, he is a very good photographer, and he makes good use of that talent by posting some nice pictures uh, on the site. And that seems to attract an audience, too. I, I sort of hinted at this, but I really didn't say much more. Um, the New Haven Independence reporters traditionally have been very good photographers, and that's been a selling point of their site as well. But good photography helps tell the story of the community, and Howard also will sell reprints on the side, so that's helpful. But here, I think, is what really distinguishes uh, the Batavian. Um, he has about 150 local ads on the site. It's a remarkable thing to look at. He runs them all on the home page. He doesn't believe in rotating them. He rotates them by position, but he doesn't, they're all there on the home page. He's got every funeral home, restaurant, insurance agency, tattoo parlor, hot dog stand. Um, it's, it's just an amazing thing to look at. No national chains. He will not take ads from national chains. I'm not sure whether any have offered, but he says he wouldn't, he wouldn't take them if they did. And he believes that one of the ways that you rebuild community and re-spark this sense of civic engagement is not just by reporting the news, but also by reconnecting with the business community um, through advertising and, um, and, and other promotional type things. And uh, I think he's right. I think he's right. And I think that his site has proved that that's a pretty remarkable way to do that. Now, finally, and by the way, they're at thebatavian.com if you want to check them out sometime. It's not a beautiful site. And some of my students have said, well, there's too many ads. And, you know, ads are beautiful. Ads are money. You can make money from ads. I mean, if you're going to go into journalism, uh, you want to know that there's a source of revenue for what you're doing. And so uh, I think every one of them is a thing of beauty, and I can see why Howard thinks that as well. Now, finally, I did want to mention the volunteer um, story that Clay Shirky alluded to. And it's almost befitting um, the problems of citizen journalism that what I'm about to tell you has not been successful. When we started down this road of online journalism, I would say about 20 years ago, um, the Boston Globe's website, which was originally Boston.com, now Boston.com is something else, although it's still affiliated with the Globe, uh, the Globe's website started in 1995, so it was like exactly 20 years ago. When we started down this road, I think there was a lot of idealism about what volunteers could bring to the table. And um, there was hope that citizen journalists would go out and cover school committee meetings and do a lot of other kinds of coverage that traditionally uh, paid journalists had done. Um, contribute to the conversation in a way that was not toxic and sociopathic, as we see on so many news sites. Bring their expertise to the table. You would hear things like, our readers are more, our readers know more than we do, uh, which actually there's a kernel of truth to it. The, the whole reason we work as reporters is that somebody out there knows more than we do. That's why we interview them. Otherwise, we would just write without ever interviewing anybody. So of course, some people know more than we do. But the citizen journalism experiment so far has not worked out particularly 
well. I like to say that the biggest reason for that is that what we as paid journalists do is not rocket science. However, what's important is that we do get paid. That's the magic. Uh, you talk about the idea that citizen journalists were going to cover the school committee for you. Um, you know, giving up three hours to sit there once a week and take notes, and then another three or four hours to write it up, that's quite a commitment, isn't it? People have to go to work. People have to make a living. People want to do other things with their lives. Um, what journalists do is not magic, but we are paid to sit there and write it up. So I think that the value of paid journalism is as great as it ever was. But is there a way, is there nevertheless a way of harnessing some of the energy of, of non-journalists who want to make some sort of contribution but don't want to make that commitment to sit through the school committee meeting every week. And this brings me to <coughs> Haverhill, Massachusetts. How many of you have ever been to Haverhill? Interesting city. Interesting city kind of halfway between Lowell and Lawrence. Um, and it is what Tom Stites calls a news desert. Tom Stites is a veteran journalist who has worked at the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune as an editor, and he has an idea. He thinks that news deserts around the country might be able to support their own cooperatively owned news sites. What is a cooperatively owned news site? He says it's like a food co-op. Um, I don't know whether there are any food co-ops around here. We don't really have them near where I live either. But you become a member, you contribute labor, you might have to bag groceries one day a month, um, you contribute money, um, and, and it's a membership model. Credit unions are co-ops, and, uh, and he thought that we might be able to do the same with news. Now, a news desert is a community um, where the traditional media have lost a lot of interest that they used to have. Haverhill used to have its own independently owned daily newspaper. It no longer does. Um, the Eagle Tribune, uh, which is the, the big regional newspaper um, headquartered in North Andover, does cover Haverhill. They do a pretty good job. I mean, they've got young reporters doing it, and they do the best they can, but there aren't enough of them. and. Uh, the, the, the company that owns the Eagle Tribune really isn't particularly interested in upgrading news coverage. The, the company that owns the Eagle Tribune is, uh, is a venture of the State Employees Retirement Fund of Alabama. And the State Employees Retirement Fund of Alabama is not terribly concerned as to whether Haverhill has another reporter or not. They want a maximum rate of return on their investment. Um, so you see, Haverhill has really kind of been left behind by the local press. Uh, there's a very, good public asset, uh, a very good public access cable operation there. There's a very interesting online radio station there that is on the verge of uh, getting a low power FM license, but they really don't have everything that they need to make a go of it. So Tom Stites conceived of the Banyan Project, as he calls it, and Haverhill has been designated as his first pilot project. And the way that, and, and the site would be called Haverhill Matters. And the way it works, the way it would work, is that there would be two full-time paid journalists. One of them would be the editor, one would be the community manager. They would probably go cover the most important stories in the community, but at the same time, they, and especially the community manager, would be designated to try to build a network of volunteers, members of the co-op, 
who might contribute labor in the form of a neighborhood blog. They might contribute um, money. Um, there's uh, many different ways that they could contribute. And the feeling is this would be a way of harnessing the power of volunteers without asking too much of them. It's a great idea. Uh, unfortunately, what's happened is in the, ep I, I write about this in the epilogue of The Wired City, and I think I wrote that it would, it would certainly launch by the end of 2013. It did not. Um, they've had a lot of problems organizing the co-op. There's a, an organizing committee of volunteers that are trying to push ahead with this. Um, it looked really good at the beginning of 2014, but then they set a fundraising goal that, in my personal opinion, was too ambitious. They have not met that goal, and here we are in uh, April of 2015, and they're still hoping to launch, but I, I don't know whether they're going to be able to do that or not. I hope they are. Tom Stites is a really interesting guy. Uh, this idea has gotten a lot of attention nationally, and uh, I'd love to see them make, to, to try to give it a go and see if it works. But at the moment, I'm not really sure whether that's going to happen or not. Um, that brings me through my presentation. Uh, we can talk about anything you want. Um, I'm, you know, we could talk about the state of the Boston Globe. We could talk about the Aaron Hernandez trial, which a verdict came in just a little while ago. Um, but I'd be curious to know what's on your mind. Any questions? Just raise your hand. Yeah, right. Hi, Richard Bernier, a BCC observer. What will what will be the overall future of journalism? The overall feature? Future. Oh, sorry. future. Sorry. Um, what will be the overall future of journalism? It, it's a great question, and of course, it's one that many of us spend a lot of time thinking about. Uh, but if anyone out there has the answer, that person is working as a very high-priced media consultant and, and not as a journalism professor. Uh, I personally don't think there's going to be any one future. I think there's going to be many futures, and I've tried to outline what some of those futures might be in the Wired City. Um, and as Clay Shirky said, there won't be any one thing that replaces newspapers, but there may be many things that replace part of what newspapers do. Um, let me mention one future that one, it, it's actually a present reality, but I think it will only become more so in the future, uh, that I did not write a lot about in my book, but that I think is a reality in your lives every day. And that is what, what we call disaggregation. What do we mean by disaggregation? Well, if you look at a typical daily newspaper, it is the product of industrial forces that came together more than 150 years ago. And there are many different types of content in a daily newspaper that now that the internet has come along, we realize don't really make any sense. There is no particular reason why there should be a daily product that has local and international news, sports, funnies, obituaries, Wednesday food ads, the crossword puzzle, um, all these different elements. The reason they came together was that printing a newspaper and delivering it was a very complicated and expensive industrial process. And it was just the most efficient way to deliver all these different products to an audience. And with technology, we don't need to deliver news that way anymore. And so therefore, everything is becoming a niche. Um, the Boston Globe has done a great job of trying to reinvent itself as a digital 
news organization, but at the same time, you wonder how they're going to deal with the next challenge, which is that I might want to go to the Globe for Statehouse news, but I don't want to go to the Globe for sports. I'll go somewhere else for sports, um, even though the Globe has very good sports coverage. Um, there's also disaggregation has led to the phenomenon that you're all familiar with. You're more familiar with it than I am, which is that I think that a lot of people under 30 really can't even conceive of, well, okay, I want to read the Globe as the Globe or the New York Times as the New York Times online. I don't care about paper, but I'll read it online. You don't think that way. You are reading through social, through what people you know and trust are sharing with you. And my experience has been you don't particularly care where it's coming from. Don't take me the wrong way. I think that young people tend to be quite discerning about the quality of what they're looking at. But what I'm saying is it's perfectly natural to be putting together your own news diet from about eight to ten sources a day, whereas um, people of an older generation are more accustomed to going to several different trusted sources and uh, just leaving it at that. That is a big challenge for the future of news, and uh, I don't think that anybody's dealing with it particularly well at the moment. What you see is that legacy news organizations such as the Globe and the Times are working very hard to try to get shared as much as possible on social, but um, that strikes me as just kind of a holding action. I don't know that, that, that that's necessarily going to be a good business model for them in the long run. I actually have a question, Dan, if I could. Sure. Um, what about the, the future of, of the network television news. It seems to be, again, an, an older demographic that tends to view those. Is that also ripe for either um, a, an evolution or a, a change in how they present their news every night? That's a great question, um, the future of the nightly network newscasts. You know, as there was a time when the three network nightly newscasts had a combined audience of over 80 million, I think. Today it's a little over 20 million. Uh, so that's a huge drop. At the same time, having a little over 20 million makes the network newscasts the closest thing we still have to a mass medium. Uh, oh, more than 20 million people is a lot of people. Um, I do think it's ripe for reinvention. I do think that at some point, one of the three networks is going to drop it. They're just going to give it up um, and try something completely different. Maybe non-news, maybe something else. Um, former CBS anchor Dan Rather, who um, had an interesting idea some years ago, and that is he said, let's just fold up the 6.30 news and instead have an hour in prime time that would be maybe a 15-minute news, update, news update and the rest of it could be more of a TV magazine style of broadcast. I would like to see that, but nobody has taken a chance on that yet. And it's, it, it's become such a well-told tale that it's almost become a joke, but it's true if you watch one of the evening newscasts, and I have to tell you, I rarely do, um, and I'll bet most of you never do, um, all of the ads are for the problems of old age. And so you can see what their demographic is. It's, uh, it's incontinence products and, and, and things like that. So you can see that, that their audience is very, very old. And military as well. Military? Well, that's interesting because I don't know who they're reaching because people of age to join the military tend not to watch the, uh, the network news. Yes, sir. Oh, I, I think that we Get want you to wait for the mic so that this is picked we'll up by cable. Okay. 
One of the things that I've been looking at is that are, are we getting closer and closer to more narrow casting? Are people now wanting specific things and just their own interests as far as news go and getting away from this concept of broadcasting and covering a lot of things, whether through things like YouTube or through podcasts, things like that? Yeah, uh, you know, there was an idea that came out of the MIT Media Lab years ago called the Daily Me. And the idea was that it would be a news product tailored to all your individual needs and interests. And on the one hand, people looked at this as potentially an exciting development. On the other hand, people said, gee, we're not really going to have a common language anymore. Um, and we've seen that happen to some extent already. Um, even though the network nightly newscasts are still the closest thing we have to a mass medium, um, two of the three cable news channels cater exclusively to like-minded viewers with Fox News appealing to the right and MSNBC appealing to the left. And um, by the way, I, I'm, you want to know how old I am? I remember when CNN used to do news. Um, that's, uh, but, uh, but yeah, there is a lot of that, certainly. You look at even the New Haven Independent, um, that's serving a small niche. And the niche is, first of all, people who are very interested in New Haven news. They don't care what's going on in the suburbs. They don't care about sports particularly. Now maybe that's only one thing they're looking at, but nevertheless, that's a narrow niche. And it tends to be widely read by the most active members of the community. It's not really something that gets a, a wide general readership. Um, I think that what a lot of people do is they'll try to get a broad briefing in the news, but then go deep on one or two areas that they're really interested in. But I've also found, when I talk to my students, that there is some suspicion, <coughs> excuse me, there is some suspicion of the news as a packaged thing. Uh, the idea that there's a certain amount of international, national, and local news that you need to be up on in order to be an informed citizen, um, I find that's a notion that a lot of my students don't really buy. But what they will do is on certain stories that they think are of particular importance, they will go really deep on those stories. Um, my son knows far more about North Korea than I do. He's, he's taken a great interest in the horrors of that regime and has just informed himself very deeply about that. And um, I know that some of my, uh, any of you are, now here I'm going to get some hands. Any of you viewers or readers of Vice? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Vice is, um, well, it's a site that started a few years ago. They do a lot of video, uh, kind of like BuzzFeed and the Huffington Post. When it started, it was mostly crap. And then it started moving up the food chain and getting better and better and offering some real quality. Vice does some remarkable video work. Uh, they did a documentary last year called Inside the Islamic State that was just, I'd never seen anything like it. I, I found a way to throw it to my TV set and sat and watched it on TV. Um, part of it was they simply showed ISIS propaganda videos, which I'd never seen. I mean, that has great value to see what their propaganda looks like. Um, so, uh, you know, Vice is, is, is a really, Vice is one of a number of rapidly improving um, quality news media that is really moving in to fill the space that a lot of the mega legacy media used to include. You got a question up here? <clears throat> Hi, David Chase, student at uh, BCC. So my question was stemming off of 
um, Professor Rick Rebello's down there was narrowing what viewers of the news want to watch. But what's interesting is you brought up Vice, which is a new, um, I think a lot of people are getting their news from apps such as Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and now Snapchat has introduced this discover side where you can view um, five news stories a day. And CNN is on there, Vice News is on there. Um, I read an interesting story on Vice about someone who forgets where they are and usually freaks out and thinks they're being attacked. I've never read anything like it, and I thought it was super interesting, and I had never heard of Vice. Since then, I'm reading Vice, learning what's going on. So do you think that journalism is moving toward engaging with younger people and trying to get on those apps? Because if they don't, there not, might not be an open dialogue with those younger viewers. I, I think that... Um I mean, obviously, the newer journalism product projects that you refer to are all over these social media platforms. I think that legacy media are trying very hard, but they can't keep up because um, certainly legacy media are all over Twitter and Facebook. I think they've been a little slower in adopting things like Instagram and Snapchat. I will confess, I have yet to make it over to Snapchat, and I really should. Um, I, I need to know what's going on in that space, and I just haven't done it. Um, there's always going to be something new, and I think news organizations have to be where their audience is. They can no longer expect their audience is going to automatically come to them, um, which, I mean, just as an aside to that, um, there are several news organizations, including the New York Times, that recently announced that they are actually going to publish some of their content direct to Facebook. It won't just be a link to their website anymore. It will be directly on Facebook. Of course, Facebook is now starting to look like a legacy media organization in itself, but nevertheless, I think it's a, another step in the evolution of news organizations trying to be wherever their, um, wherever their audience is. Anybody else? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to go off on a little bit of a different end from what they were covering. Um, I'm going to talk more, more about uh, the music industry and the media, so to speak. But, um, from my, from my observations, I have a question as a fellow musician. Um, it seems like nowadays there are, there are many hot spots of where mainstream media comes about, the specific locations in the United States, as opposed to where it used to be coming about from a community. And basically, like, communities were, would give music acts or great music acts railroad tracks, so to speak, to get them on their way. Do you think... Um, News uh, the news sources like the New Haven Independent could sort of be the engine to, to cultivate like, and harness more of independent music to get, it more push to get it pushing again and give us a wider variety instead of corporate, just corporate media all the time on the radio and such and such? Uh, the answer is I do. Um I'm not sure that, it, that, that these new projects are ready to be as effective as the alternative weeklies of some years ago were, simply because they don't have as wide a reach, at least not yet. When I was reporting The Wired City, the New Haven Independent did almost no arts coverage, for instance. Now they actually do quite a bit, so it could be a, um, it could be a venue uh, for local music in ways that it wasn't before. Um, but, you know, we've seen the nationalization of culture in the last generation, and, and it's, um, it's, there's a lot of negatives to that. It's very difficult for local musicians to get the word out. I mean, when I was working at the Boston Phoenix, we also had an independent radio station. Um, WFNX, which was part of the Phoenix. And um, I remember talking to a, somebody in the music industry once who said, 
people from the labels come into Boston, and there's really only two places they go. One of them is whoever's running all the corporate stuff, and then they go to WFNX, and now WFNX isn't there. But we are starting to see the growth of some online radio stations. Uh, the Globe has an online radio station now called Radio BDC. Um, I do think some of these smaller projects can help get the word out about local music. Uh, but there's no question that, um, that the kind of uh, localism in music that you're talking about is very hard to do these days. I, I remember when, uh, before he became a big national success, uh, Bruce Springsteen was big in Boston, New Jersey, and Philadelphia. And that's where he got the big crowds. Uh, the Jay Giles Band was big in Boston and Detroit. Um, you don't see that sort of thing anymore. They either break through nationally or they stay very local and they don't make any money. Anything else? Oh, right um, I find that in the news today, like um, TV news and newspapers, that they cover pretty much the same kind of topics all the time and a lot of negativity. Do you think that um, smaller projects like the New Haven Independent, if they covered more interesting and a more um, wide variety of topics that appeal to a larger audience than these newspapers, that they could event eventually be bigger and take over, over the um, TV news and the newspapers that are popular today? When you talk about what you don't like about local TV news, I assume you mean it's just kind of a relentless parade of, of crime and, and, and fires and that sort of thing. Is that yes. what you're referring to? Yeah. Um, I don't know that these kinds of projects would ever overtake the local TV news. Um, I'm not sure that they're really designed to. Um, I do think that these smaller projects may have smaller audiences, but I also think they're more, they're more engaged with it than people who watch the local TV news who oftentimes are just you know, sitting there zoned out waiting for the weather uh, and trying to get up the energy to get up and go to bed. Um, local TV news is, the audience for local TV news is much smaller than it used to be. And um, it seems to me that they've tried everything except uh, quality. Um, and they all have their strong points. I mean, um, the local TV news stations do have some good journalism on them, but there's, but there's certainly an overwhelming amount of stuff that really doesn't matter. And a lot of them are biased, too, I find. In, in what a, way? Um, just like the whole liber, like liberal conservative thing, I find that certain ones lean more in a direct, one direction than the other instead of having like um, diversity in that okay. area. I mean, gee, if we're talking about local TV news, I don't know that there's a liberal or conservative way to cover a building that's on fire. but. No. Uh, but, um, but, but I, I, I take your point. I absolutely take your point. I, I do think that in other types of media, we do tend to see quite yeah, a bit not, of bias. Yeah, not necessarily local TV news, but in other areas, there's definitely some bias that... Yep, absolutely. Is there. Absolutely. And there are, there are um, people and organizations that try to track that bias. And uh, I guess the best solution to that is to try to tap into a variety so that you're, you're getting different types of bias to see how that plays out. Thank you. Thank you. One final question. I know we're close to the end of the class time here. One more. Sure. Okay, my question is about what could she you, was saying. Could I ask you to speak up? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. My question is, do you think with the local news stations, they've lost a lot of their viewers because of all the violence they display on TV? Um, short answer, no. Um, longer answer is 
The reason that all television news has lost a huge amount of audience over the years is because of choices. Um, it used to be that you got into certain time slots, the only thing on TV was the news. And since it would never occur to people to turn off the TV, that just doesn't happen, you'd watch the news. Mm -hmm. um, now, there are many other things that you can watch other than the news. Now, I do think there's a little bit of a vicious cycle that goes on, and that is, as audience drops, there's a temptation to try to sensationalize things a little more to see if you can get the numbers back up or at least slow down the decline. Um, there was an interesting study done a number of years ago uh, when the local TV news business was healthier than it is today um, by a group called the Rocky Mountain Media Project. I'm not sure if they're still around or not. Uh, what they found was that if new owners came into a city and took over a TV station and really went downscale with a real sensationalistic approach to doing local news. That was a surefire way of moving up in the ratings to a certain extent, but that they would usually plateau at number two. That the number one station almost always was of higher quality. So sensationalism works, but only up to a point. People, if, if, if quality works even more. And what the Rocky Mountain Media Group was trying to show people was, if you really want to succeed, offer quality. But I don't know how many newscasts paid attention to that. Any last, last question? OK. All right, if not. Again, thank you, Dan, oh, for coming Oh, we have today. a last, last question. Right here. Oh, right, right here. Oh, sorry, Denise. Denise Pumaguaye for BCC Observer. I can't hear you at all. Oh, I'm sorry. Denise Pumaguaye for the BCC Observer. Uh, uh, speaking of quality, uh, what's your take on the uh, embarrassing uh, story about the Rolling Stone um, printing a, a story that wasn't uh, fact-checked about a student allegedly being raped at, um, at the University of Virginia? I'm sorry, I didn't Should hear that. About the Rolling Stone um, uh, piece on the alleged rape. Uh, oh, so we're going to do a second hour. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. That was that was. I don't know how to even describe the Rolling Stone story. That story broke every standard that we have in our craft. Um, essentially, if, if you read the Columbia Journalism Review report, uh, the reporter had only one real source, and that was the young woman who said she had been the victim of, of this horrific sexual assault. So only one source. Of course, she wasn't identified in the story because uh, people who have been victims of sexual assault or who say they've been victims of sexual assault by custom are not identified in the press. And she, uh, the reporter almost went out of her way not to find out facts that might have changed her mind about what she had learned. And that in particular, not going to the f three friends who the alleged victim said she had spoken to shortly after the, the incident. And she, according to her, all spoke to her in a very insensitive manner and didn't really take her as seriously as they should have. These people were findable and they should have been interviewed. Never mind the alleged assailant. Of course, he should have been interviewed. But if she had taken, the reporter had taken the fairly easy step of just talking to the th three friends, the Columbia report makes it clear that the whole story would have fallen apart at that point. Um, I would like to think this is not representative of what um, 
journalists do. Uh, what makes this especially disturbing is that Rolling Stone uh, is an important news outlet with a good reputation. Um, and uh, it does kind of make you worry about what other landmines may be out there that, that haven't gone off yet. Um, and of course, the problem of sexual assault on college campuses is very real and, and needs to be addressed better than it has. And this story has been a setback to that effort as well. So there's really not much good you can say about it, that's for sure. Okay, now let's thank Dan for joining us again today. Thank you.